what is the best book? What is the best tech book to learn from? Um, this is a tough question because it depends on what you want to do, right? There are tech reference books, which I'll do a separate video about. And then there are tech books that are designed to specifically to help you learn. And if I had one criticism of the tech book industry in general, it's that so many books don't know what they want to be. Um, you have the recipe books from O'Reilly, which are really amazing. Um, you know, I depended on those during my career. Um, in fact, Unix in a nutshell was the very first O'Reilly book I ever owned. Uh, I still have it somewhere. It's a collector's item at this point. And it was amazing, right? But did it really, I remember reading it. It felt like I was reading a dictionary, right? Um, there are a bunch of academic books, which are kind of outside both of these categories. Um, thank you for the sub. We have academic books, which are not written for the learner at all. They're written for the person that's going to force the people learning to buy the book. And I, I not including those cat in the category. Unfortunately, they're overpriced and people have to buy them. There's a, there's a rant I made about whether you should pay for, or for books or not in a separate video, go watch that. Um, if you want to hear me rant more about the horrible economy of academic writing, I think it's a disaster. I think it's, I don't want to go talk about it. It's very negative. So what are the good books? The good books are books like this one, Head First See. Now, when I first encountered this very, very silly book, um, you know, I was very skeptical. You got to understand, I am a guy who comes from a sort of the tradition of like, hey, if it's not a serious book, it's not a serious thing, you know. And yes, I do believe that you should read the Bash Man page to learn Bash, you know, RTFM, read the fancy manual. Uh, a lot of times you don't need a book at all. Um, but you know, on occasion, a book is extremely valuable. And it was, it was kind of fun to realize that the Head for C series, when I read the introduction to it, and I will read it to you now, um, that it was consistent with what I had been doing at Skillstack for a long time. So something I learned completely organically without any training at all was if I wanted learning to stick um, in, you know, these nine to 19 year olds brains that I needed to make it fun. It turns out that there's a lot of science behind this. There's dopamine, uh, that causes learning to happen. And there's, you know, and it's actually itemized a little bit in something I'm about to read here, but there are a lot of reasons that, that remembering things, putting things in story form, making, we used to use memes. We will use memes. In fact, if you, uh, check out the other videos, which I haven't made yet on learning to code and polyglot approach, learning Python, JavaScript, and go at the same time, we will begin to be coding some very silly memes. Um, because honest to God, this is exactly how it happened. I'm going to tell you the story and then I'll tell you why I think these books are so valuable because of it. So, a lot of times, in, again, organic learning happens in the lab, not the lecture hall. That's a quote I would like to put on my wall someplace because the lab is where you get to experiment and fail and try and have fun and there's no pressure, right? It's not somebody up there like telling you, yeah, memes are even a job now. Um, it's not somebody up there telling you, you know, flexing and showing all kinds of academic, you know, prowess or whatever. You're, they, they don't care about you. They just want to flex. And you know, the lab is where the if people get excited about learning and stuff like that. Right. So anyway, given that atmosphere, and I made other videos about that, but people were coming to me and they're coming into my lab and sure they're paying, your parents are paying 50 bucks an hour or something, but they still want to have fun. And they've been, you know, they've been at school all day and they don't really want to come and sit in another school class. So I said, okay, what are we going to do today, guys? Let's have fun. And they're like, Oh, let's, let's code the waffle song. I know that's really dating me. It's a really old meme. Um, and I go, what the, what's the waffle song? You know, one time they said, Hey, let's code, let's code llamas with hats, which is totally disgusting and inappropriate. And <laughs> we're not going to do it. But you know, another time they were like, well, let's code this. And I said, Oh, how about we include this one? Let's, let's code, let's code the bridge keeper. And they're like, what's the bridge keeper? And I showed them Monty Python bridge keeper skit. And they're like, Oh my God, that's so awesome. So, our educational time together became an exchange of memes and fun video clips um, that then we would say, well, what can we code? How can we code that? 
right? And Badgers, we coded the Badger song once to do, you know, numbered loops and things. I'm like, well, what, what principle from programming can we associate with this meme, with this fun thing that these kids want to do? And, and, and we, we, we would constantly find, you know, they would come in and say, let's code, but because they were, their life revolved around memes, which still is true for a lot of young people. And so we would, we would make all kinds of different weird things. And, um, and it was really fun and, and, and they remembered it. And I actually, wit came up to me several years later. Um, I've told the story before, but I'm telling it again, but he came up to me several years later. They were talking about after he got his a system administrator job at 16. Um, he was, I mean, he was extremely talented. He was running all the Minecraft servers and everything. He, he taught himself, uh, all kinds of different things with languages and, um, had evaluated, you know, Kubernetes versus uh, Docker Swarm on his own at like 15. I mean, if you know what these things are, you know that this guy had had really blossomed. And and he came back to me some years later and he said, you know, Mr. Rob, you know what really worked for me when you did those micro projects, those little meme projects. And he's and this is his direct feedback. He said, when you did that, when I couldn't remember something. I remembered the meme that went with it. I remember the meme and I was able to pull the meme up and, and then I could actually go find the meme in my GitHub where I had coded it in my private repo and I could remind myself how I did it. And it, it came back to my memory much easier. And that my friends is how learning happens. And that is the basis of the brain friendly guides coming from O'Reilly. And when I read that, when I read that, I was immediately on board. As silly as it was, I was like, oh, I see. They're using actual pedagogical scientific studies that have shown that this actually works. And so here you read right here, it says, um, we think your time is too valuable to waste struggling with new concepts, using the latest research in cognitive science and learning theory to craft a multi-sensory learning experience. That is what I was doing organically and on accident by observing in what I called the learning lab where learning, I was learning about learning in a laboratory environment and I was able to adjust how the learning was happening based on what worked and what didn't. So, you know, they were learning in a learning lab and I was learning in a learning lab. I was learning about learning. And one of the things I learned about learning was that a multi-sensory, you know, meme driven sort of learning experience helped it to stick better and it made it fun. We had a blast in there. We would put music on, we would take musical breaks and we would dance around like crazy people. I did not know that all of the dopamine that was being produced by that entire experience was solidifying the learning that they were doing and giving them solid pneumonic, 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 did I say that right? Memory, things to grab onto in their memory. It turns out also, by the way, my friends, that the people who memorize pi to like, a hundred digits or whatever, these people who have memory competitions, guess how they do it? They make a story. They imagine a story, a visual story, the crazier, the better in their head. And then they tell themselves that story and they associate a number with each one. That's how they win those competitions. They do it through multisensory learning by creating our story because our brains are designed to do stories. That's why we like to be, to hear stories when we're taught and, um, and, and all of that. So, so when we read here, that head per C usually uh, uses a visually rich to format design for the way your brain works, not a text heavy approach that puts you to sleep. And this is the part where I'm going to defend my criticism of K and RC. Um, people who are the authorities on a particular language uh, or, or system are often the worst people on the planet to write a book about it. Because they are going to give you this really boring, put you to sleep thing, and everybody's going to call it the Bible. I learned from K and R C. Um, yeah, Moonwalking with Einstein: The Art and Science of Remembering Everything is a cool book on that. That's so cool. That's a, that's a very very cool book. Um, I thank you for the recommendation. So so when I you know again when I was skeptical of these books when I first saw them and this approach in general, I was skeptical of it because it looks really silly. Let me show you. Like when you, when you go into the book, you're like, what this is a, I, I've got, it's all kind of 
reverse because I don't want to blind you, but look at how silly it is, right? Who is this book for? Do you already know programming? I can't believe you put C in this book. It's got these really, really silly things in here, right? So here we go. It says, uh, we know what your brain is thinking. Your brain craves novelty. It's what it, it always searches, scanning, waiting for something unusual. This is why memes are so popular. It was built that way and it helps you stay alive. So what does your brain do with the routine, ordinary, normal things you encounter? Everything everything it can to stop them from interfering with the brain's real job, recording things that matter. It doesn't bother saving, saving the boring things. They'll never make it past that. This is obviously not important filter. So how does your brain know what's important? Suppose you're out for a day hike and a tiger jumps in front of you. What happens inside your head and your body? Neurons fire, emotions crank up, chemicals surge. And that's how your brain knows. This must be important. Don't forget it. But imagine you're home in the library. It's safe, warm, tiger-free zone. You're studying, trying to get ready for an exam. One thing, um, or trying to learn some tough topic technically, 10 days that would take a week or 10 days at the most. Just one problem. Your brain's, your brain's trying to do a bigger favor. It's trying to make sure that that this is obviously unimportant content doesn't clutter up the spaces and you end up falling asleep. <laughs> Resources are better storing things that really matter, like tigers, the dangers of life, like the fun stuff, like how you should never be posting these party photos on your Facebook page. There's no simple way to tell your brain, hey brain, thank you very much, but no matter how dull this book is and how little I'm in registering this emotional Riker Rick Rick scale right now, I really do want to keep this stuff around. So, so that's what it says here, what we think of the head for C as a learner. Uh, so what does it take to learn something? First of all, you need to get it. You, uh, if you're going to get it, you need to not forget it. And how do you remember it? That comes back to the visual imaging. Some of the head first principles, make it visual. Images are far more memorable than words alone. Make it much more effective. Uh, use a conversational personal, personalized style. And this, by the way, shapes everything that I've ever done. Uh, I want to keep it personal. I, if I can pick a big word and I use a simple word, if I'm going to do the big word, I'm going to, you know, tell you what the big word means. Um, you know, and it says, get the learner to think more deeply. Um, they don't actually say this, but it says right here, get and keep the reader's attention and touch their emotions. There is something that's implied in that, that they're not saying. And that is storytelling. Storytelling is used to memorize the pi out to 100 digits. It's also used to convey meaning to the brain from one human to another. We think in narrative. That's, that's how we are operated. It's the reason that we binge watch Netflix or whatever. We are designed. We, are, we, we like story. We like narrative. And the more visual, the better. The more imaginative, the better. So... You know, if you can put something into a role play, they will learn it better every time, every time. And I was a big D&D guy. I also use role play to help train Mormon missionaries. I'm not Mormon anymore, but it was very effective, right? Because people were able to play out a story in their brain interactively and remember it with a, an experience. And a lot of people think that this is why gaming is such a powerful way to do education as well because you are creating actual narrative experiences in a visual pseudo physical environment where people can 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 you know they can other the neurons in their brain are going to trigger to remember the the principle behind it because there's so much else going on uh in that time I mean, you think it would be a distraction it's actually not if, if it's associated with the thing they're learning then it turns into metacognition thinking about thinking and this is why the Head First series is, is, is superior to everything else in my book uh, for learning, specifically for learning. It says here, the final thing, the trick is to get your brain to see the new material you're learning as really important, crucial to your well-being, as important as a tiger. Uh, otherwise, you're in for a constant battle with your brain, doing its best to keep new content for sticking. Another way to make it stick in your brain is, is we, we assign a lot of importance to things that are funny. You know, the reason that these, the, you know, the story I told with the, the kids coming in and saying, hey, Mr. Rob, have you seen the latest meme? Because to them, that's important, right? That's something worth remembering. If I don't remember this meme, people are going to laugh at me or, or, or I like it because it's entertaining. And so whether it's a meme or it's, you know, it's a silly image or whatever it is, that's, how, that's what you're going to remember. And that's the way to do the learning. And that's why I am a big fan of the Head First series, because they have taken the most recent discoveries in learning theory and they have gotten totally on board with it despite immense criticism from the academic world because the academic books are going to put you to sleep and empty your wallet. These, these books aren't, 
and this, this approach is going to keep you stimulated. This, I'm also going to refer back to this video when we do, you know, Python Bridge Keeper um, or, you know, Badgers or we ask, hey, is there a meme that you guys want to code? You know, let's let's code it and let's associate the latest funny, silly meme with something specifically about your learning so that you can take it with you and prosper and win and, you know, dominate the day. So.